Thinking about hitting the road this summer? The idea is nothing new. We are going to take you back more than 100 years. Welcome to Textination. I'm Fred Fishkin. With us is Wes Davis, author of a brand new book titled American Journey, On the Road with Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, and John Burroughs. Great to see you, Wes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. And congratulations on the book just out. So how did it come about that Henry Ford developed this friendship with the naturalist John Burroughs, first of all? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess maybe I should say something about who John Burroughs was. I think anybody listening to your show is going to know uh, Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, but they may be less familiar with Burroughs. Uh, he was a writer who, uh, around the time Ford met him, so 1913, was among the most popular writers in the country. Uh, he had about two dozen books out at that point, uh, and school children in particular loved him because uh, many of his essays, he, he wrote about the natural world, often about bird life, um, wrote about his expeditions in, in nature with people like Teddy Roosevelt, and many of those essays had wound up in readers that were used in schools um, and children, you know, really took to these. And so uh, wherever Burroughs went, you know, troops of school children would show up to to meet him and, and ask what he was writing next. Uh, but he was from an earlier generation. So I, I think he was right around a quarter of a century older than Henry Ford. And his roots go back into the 19th century. He was a very close friend of Walt Whitman, uh, the great transcendentalist poet. He was also on friendly terms with Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, you know, in a way launched American literature and, and American philosophy. And in fact, when Burroughs's first uh, sort of important essay came out uh, in the Atlantic Monthly, it was at a time when the Atlantic published their uh, their articles anonymously, and it was assumed by everyone that the article that this this Burroughs article, which, which was called Expression, was actually written by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it was listed that way in Poole's Index, which was the sort of guide to periodical literature of the day. And the last time I checked, it still was. I mean, it's that's how close he was to Emerson at that moment. Um, but I think that experience led Burroughs to realize he needed to develop his own style, which he he did, and uh, he developed a uh, a style that was really closely focused on the real details of the natural world, and as I say, particularly on on bird life. That turned out to be uh, the thing that connected him to Henry Ford. Um, I I can say more about that. Uh, as he approached his, his 50th birthday, Ford was becoming deeply nostalgic. Uh, he was thinking a lot about his childhood on a farm in Dearborn. I don't think he loved farm life when he was actually living there as a boy. He, he did everything he could to get out of farm work. Uh, and in fact, a lot of his mechanical tinkering was dedicated toward finding ways to, to ease the burden of the work he had to do. But as he got older, he looked back on that time uh, with, with great fondness, and he began to fixate on this one particular moment, which he said was his earliest memory. Uh, and what had happened is that his father had come to find Henry when he was about four years old and had taken him and his younger brother, who was not even walking at the time. So the father scoops up the younger brother, takes Henry by the hand, and takes them out into the fields near their farmhouse and shows them this great oak tree that has fallen over. And he has Henry bend down and look at a point where a branch meets the trunk and uh, points out a, the, a bird's nest that has been built there. And Henry sees that there are eggs there and he, you know, he figures out that it's a song sparrow. And even in his 50s, he could remember the song of that song sparrow. Uh, so birds became for him this kind of link to his past. Because of that, he, he began reading John Burroughs. Uh, his wife, Clara Ford, gave Henry a um, full set of Burroughs' works in 1912. So Ford is reading through these. 
And then in, uh, I think around December, 1912, he comes across an article, I think again in the Atlantic Monthly, in which uh, Burroughs is saying that the automobile is going to ruin our experience of nature, that it will spoil nature for us because it, it moves us through the landscape too rapidly to really appreciate the world around us. It brings noise and pollution into uh, the pristine environment of nature, and it's, it's nothing but bad. Uh, Henry Ford, of course, did not agree with this. Uh, I think, you know, for Ford, it wasn't just that he was making a lot of money from selling the Model T, which at this point is the best-selling car in the country, I, I think probably the best-selling car in the world. Uh, but he, he, I think Ford genuinely believed that uh, an affordable car like the Model T would help rural people, it would help farmers by giving them easy access to towns where they could pick up supplies and that they could sort of get out of the isolation of farm life. But he also believed that it would bring urban people, and this is at a moment when the population of the United States is moving from you know, a rural agrarian mode of life to a, an urbanized mode. Um, he believed that the, the automobile would bring those urban people out into nature and give them a new appreciation of that world uh, and would help to preserve nature. So he writes to John Burroughs and offers to give him a Model T. And so that's actually how I latched into this story. I came across a letter in which Burroughs at the end of 1912 is writing to a friend of his and he says, Henry Ford of automobile fame is an admirer of my books and he wants to give me a, a new Model T. And Burroughs is at first, you know, sort of reluctant to do this. He he doesn't like the technology. He doesn't think it has anything to do with him. But he eventually, I, I think, you know, Ford is one of the most famous men in the country at this point. And I think Burroughs wants to get to know him. So he writes back and he says, if, if Mr. Ford would like to give me an automobile, I should be pleased to receive it. And uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, Model T shows up at Burroughs' farm in West Park up on the Hudson, and that gets the story rolling. And then the, these road trips developed, beginning, I think, with, with New England and uh, eventually involving Thomas Edison, too. Tell, tell us the story here. What happens? Uh, yeah, so Ford and Edison were already friends. Um, Henry Ford, this is sort of strange to, to think of, but Henry Ford had actually worked at the Edison Illuminating Company in Detroit. Um, he took that job at a time in the 1890s when he was beginning to work on his internal combustion engine, this first, his first one. And when he had tested that engine, he took it into the kitchen of the apartment where he was living, clamped the engine to the kitchen sink, and ran a, um, a wire down from, from the uh, the light fixture in the kitchen, which was the only lighting in the apartment, and used that to produce the spark that would you know detonate the fuel mixture and get the engine running. That worked. Uh, it also filled the kitchen with exhaust fumes and noise, of course. Uh, but Ford realized that that was a primitive system and that he needed to learn more about electricity. So he actually quit his job in Dearborn and moved his family into Detroit, took this job at the Edison Illuminating Company. And although Ford knew nothing about electrical generation, he had had a lot of experience with uh, steam engines and steam was used to generate the electricity at this point. So Ford very quickly rises to the post of chief engineer uh, so that in 1896, when there was a convention of uh, Edison employees in Brooklyn, Ford is selected to travel there and take part in the convention. So he shows up there, meets Thomas Edison. Uh, someone says, this young man is, you know, is trying to build uh, an internal combustion vehicle. Edison wants to hear about this. So I, as you may know, Edison was quite deaf. He was completely deaf in one ear and largely deaf in the other. So the, 
the whole table sort of moves around so Ford can be put next to Edison and kind of shout into his ear about this project he's undertaken. And Edison is completely captivated by this. He, he thinks this is a great idea. As you can imagine, Edison had a kind of long-term vision for an electric car, but he knew that at the moment, the battery technology was not ready for that. The range you know, would be too limited. Um, and so he encouraged Henry Ford and that was a sort of great spur to Ford's confidence. And he goes back and, and works on, on his car and eventually gets, gets um, a vehicle working. And so that friendship you know, continues, but it isn't until Ford meets Burroughs and the three of them come together that the Ford Edison relationship really blossoms and they begin traveling together and it becomes a much more sort of personal and close, close friendship. Where did they go? Tell me about the trips that they took. And, and some of these were camping adventures, correct? That's right. Yeah. And in fact, so in my book, I focus on on what I think of as the greatest of these trips, which was a, a big uh, camping expedition in which they drove down into the Smoky Mountains. Um, and, I'll, you know, so I guess we can get to that. But but to get there, there are a series of other uh, trips in, in 1913 after Burroughs had visited Ford in Dearborn to thank him for the Model T. And, and Burroughs was really impressed with the, the production facility there, which is kind of interesting because he's this naturalist with roots in the 19th century. Uh, and he was really interested in seeing the Model Ts rolling off the assembly line. And this is kind of a key moment in uh, automobile history because when Burroughs visits, uh, Ford has just started a production line that is that is manufacturing the magnetos for the Model T, you know, which provided the the, the spark for the, the uh, combustion. Those had previously been made by workers who would build a magneto by hand, but when Burroughs visits, they're now for the first time moving along a conveyor in which one man puts a bolt in, the next man tightens it. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's all very compartmentalized, and um, the the time to produce a magneto has dropped from twenty minutes to five, and you know, so that's where we are in history. Burroughs is awed by this, so when Ford comes to visit him later that year, he wants to show him something equally impressive. He, of course, doesn't have a factory, but he takes him up to Concord, Massachusetts, uh, to see. Uh, the home of Ralph Waldo Emerson to go out to Walden Pond, where Thoreau had conducted his experiment that leads to the book Walden. And I think of this as like, you know, Ford showed Burroughs his factory. Burroughs shows Ford sort of the factory of American literature and, and American philosophy. And uh, Ford loved this. It had a profound effect on him. And he says at one point that Burroughs gave him Emerson and Emerson would wind up being a very strong influence on, on Ford in some kind of important ways. But it also gave them uh, a kind of love for road travel. And so that's the trip that launches things. Uh, so from there, I, I trace them on a trip out to San Francisco or Ford and Edison on a trip out to San Francisco um, to the Panama Pacific Exposition. They take that trip by train, but at the same time, uh, Ford's son Edsel uh, and uh, Edison's son Theodore are separately uh, and just you know by their by their own volition driving out to the fair in Model Ts that Ford had given them, and so Ford and Edison have a great time on this trip. Then they start hearing the stories of their children's road travel out to the fair, and Edison as they're leaving San Francisco announces that you know they, they need to travel together and that maybe they should do it by automobile and they should camp out at night and really uh, experience the rural world again. And Burroughs did uh, at least some of this with him and it wasn't always easy because he was not a, a young man, right? Uh, that's right, yeah, Burroughs. So by the time of the 1918 trip, uh, Burroughs is 81, I believe. Uh, 
so this is it's definitely challenging for him. And in fact, uh, in 1916, when uh, Burroughs, Edison, and Harvey Firestone went up into the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains, Burroughs had felt he was too old to do it, and they showed up at his farm to depart on this trip. And he said, "I'm, you know, I'm not going to do it. My traveling days are behind me." But Firestone had recruited uh, a chef from a restaurant that was that was on the campus of the Firestone facility uh, to come with them. So he gets the chef to cook up a great dinner that evening while they're on Burroughs' farm. Burroughs eats the meal and announces that he's going on the trip. So he travels with them in 1916. Uh, Ford is supposed to join them on that on that trip, but um, you know they keep receiving telegrams for it from him saying, you know, I'll be there at the next stop and. I'll be there, I'll be there. And eventually he, he doesn't make it. That, that sort of falls apart. But in 1918, the whole group comes together. Uh, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Harvey Firestone, uh, his son, Harvey Firestone Jr., uh, and John Burroughs. They, the two groups, the Midwest Party, Ford and Firestone, and the Eastern Party, Burroughs and Edison, uh, travel toward Pittsburgh where they meet up. And from there, they drive down through central Pennsylvania, up over Summit Mountain, uh, slice off Western Maryland, then up into the mountains of West Virginia, down uh, through Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee and into the Smoky Mountains uh, in, in Tennessee and North Carolina. And Edison had selected this, this route uh, because he always wanted to get uh, basically to the worst roads. Uh, you know, roads were not good anyway. I mean, this is the time when the automobile is in its infancy. Um, travel by automobile, you know, is, is very rare. And so roads in cities are okay, but once you get outside the cities, you know, between cities, the roads start to dwindle. They're not paved often. Um, in some cases, they're just wagon tracks and they're washed out in inclement weather. Uh, but even that wasn't challenging enough for Edison. So he always wanted to get, you know, into the, into the highest mountains and the most difficult terrain. And so that's where he took the group. Uh, Burroughs, uh, who had traveled, you know, in, in very remote areas by foot, as I say, with, with people like Teddy Roosevelt, found this uh, incredibly difficult, and he was constantly sort of complaining to Edison as they're bouncing over these rough roads. And uh, the nature of his complaint is that Edison, you know, doesn't mind this because he's cushiony. You know, Edison was a somewhat stout man at this point, and Burroughs weighed 128, 130 pounds, had no cushioning, and and found this all challenging. I, th I found one of the more fascinating things uh, about the book to be that here are these titans of industry changing the world, and yet they found the time to take these trips and, and be out there. I don't know how many days, how many weeks they spent on the road. I guess, and I, I thought maybe there's a lesson to be learned for all of us here about uh, connecting with nature and still being able to change the world. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and in fact, you know, not only were they busy men, but by 1918, the U.S. had joined uh, the First World War. Edison was working for the Naval Advisory Board, trying to come up with technology that could bring the Navy into the modern era and help uh, give uh, our ships an advantage in, in warfare at sea. Ford was work, you know, Ford had famously tried to stop the war uh, with this peace ship expedition in, in 1915. But once that failed and, and the U.S. joined the war, he threw himself into the war effort. So at that time in 1918, he's building uh, these what the Navy called Eagle boats, which were patrol boats designed to um, track down and destroy submarines because uh, German submarine warfare had crippled shipping uh, in the Atlantic. So, you know, they're busy men who are now doubly busy, but they take this couple of weeks to, you know, escape from the world they had themselves created and um, get out in, into nature. 
but ideas flow from this, you know, that it, I think it enriches all of their sort of thinking and more than pays off the, the time they spend. And for younger readers, there were no cell phones, there were no text messages to stay, to stay connected to the office, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was, it was very hard to stay in touch. Uh, they would stop sometimes at post offices and send telegrams or, you know, they would have mail forwarded to various stops. But I mean, even at that, the places they had mail forwarded to were not particularly reliable. You know, so there's there's one instance in which uh, they're looking for a particular town uh, in the Appalachian South, and one member of the party has had his mail forwarded there. They come to a crossroads that seems to point to the next town they think is coming up. So they think, oh, we must have taken the wrong turn. So they go into a tiny store to say, you know, where is Kaiser's Ridge? Uh, and it turns out that store is Kaiser's Ridge. You know, that's sort of all that exists of the town is one little country store. So, I mean, you know, when we think of road trips now, we think of uh, all of the infrastructure of road culture, gas stations, fast food restaurants, motels, uh, garages. Maybe charging we, stations. <laughs> uh, charging stations. Yes, right. Uh, and and none of that existed, you know, and maintenance was hard to find. So there are great stories in which a car will break down and Henry Ford himself climbs out of the car, takes off his jacket, rolls up his sleeve, gets underneath and figures out what's wrong and uh, makes the repair. Amazing. So the lessons that uh, that you feel that are Im important here, I mean, it, it's more than just a casual read. Yeah, so as I say, a lot of real effects come out of this. I, I mean, I know we don't have time to go into them, but I'll just mention that you know I I make the case that Ford's five dollar workday is is influenced by his friendship with Burroughs and that trip they take to um, Emerson's world in Concord, Massachusetts. Ford's uh, program of village industries, in which he sort of decentralizes production and builds these small factories, often converting old grist mills, um, comes out of the 1918 trip where, where they cannot pass a water wheel without stopping to inspect the mill. The mill. You know, they're, they're fascinated by water power. Um, the interest that Firestone, Ford, and Edison all take in uh, finding new modes of rubber production I think that comes out of these travels that they undertake together. So all of that is there. Uh, and, you know, obviously on one level, this is a book um, about the road trips. It's about adventure travel at a time when travel by automobile is new and difficult. Roads are bad and challenging. Uh, but ultimately, I think this is a book about, uh, about friendship. You know, these are these are men who may not seem to have anything in common, but because of the way they met and because of these travels they undertake together, they, um, they you know, they form these really, I think, significant friendships. And there's a great moment in the 1918 trip when uh, they're in, uh, I think, Narrows, Virginia. They're camped on uh, Wolf Creek, where it flows into a bend in the New River. Uh, and in the morning, they're they're having breakfast. Burroughs is writing a letter to Clara Ford to sort of tell her what's going on because Henry Ford doesn't write letters. And Ford comes over and sets up next to Burroughs and Burroughs sees that he's working at this cedar log and he's he's stripping the bark off, off the log. And it turns out Ford wants all the members of the party to sign this log as a souvenir of their trip. So he gets everyone to sign it. And then he inscribes a kind of slogan on the log. And it says, your best friend is the one who brings out the best in you. And I think for Ford, that's what these trips meant. You know, I think these are the people who brought out the best in him. And uh, when this group dissolved after Burroughs' death, I think Ford really felt the loss. I think this was all very important to him. Just wonderful. And you you have some uh, terrific photos in here, too, that, that I you had to dig through archives to find. Yes. Yeah. And the, many of those came from uh, the Henry Ford. Uh, 
and some came from the National Park Service. And anyone who's interested in this should visit the Henry Ford because they have uh, you know thousands of photos from this from this period, and it's a it's a remarkable uh, collection. The title again is American Journey on the Road with Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, and John Burroughs. Wes Davis, congratulations on the title, and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed chatting with you.